an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva. I'm one of the hosts of this summit, and I'm thrilled, really happy to have today with me a few of my colleagues from the Emergence Network. Welcome, Herring. Welcome, Tony. Welcome, Yeho. Yeho Beltran and Erin Dunford are talking with, to us from uh, Mexico, from Oaxaca, and Tony is talking from Devon, right? In the United Kingdom. So we've been we've we've been working together on this space called the Emerges Network, which is a bit of a wild <laughs> wild beast. So I would really like to start by maybe inviting us to share a bit of what, what, why we we were drawn or joined the, the this network? What is relevant of its work for us? Well, what what is exciting us in the work that the Emergence Network is doing? I could speak. Uh. <clears throat> so I had not heard of the Emergence Network until I first worked with Bio and also Manish down the road from where I live at a place called Schumacher College. And I was invited to facilitate and co-teach with them on a course on radical activism. And within that time of meeting each other for the first time, I was invited to join 10 and kind of said yes without even knowing what it was. And for, there's something in that moment that there was a spirit just in that saying yes to the invitation without having a clue what I was saying yes to, that, that for me expresses something about what I've experienced over the last couple of years being part of this emergence network. And I don't think we've ever had a conversation between us, certainly not with me present, saying what does emergence mean? And yet I, I think we're experiencing it in terms of where we... Uh, create structures for ourselves and also go rogue and meander and uh, different people arrive from different places in the uh, outside of the structures. And there's something that at the heart of it for me is a spirit of curiosity and a spirit of questioning the, the norms that we've been, um, most of us have been swimming in in different ways, even though we're from all around the world. So there's something about a, a deep spirit of, of creativity and play in addressing the kind of issues that can break us, that break our hearts daily. Something like that. I would like to build on that because it's pretty similar to the way I get involved in the Emergence Network. I was invited to co-curate a, a kind Kindness Festival, a festival of kindness in the streets of London three years ago, exploring uh, how a new notion of sanctuary could come through, you know, and um, it felt pretty aligned to what I was working at that time about um, friendship as an attitude to meet the otherness of the other, you know, so... And that doesn't mean, I want to clarify, because that doesn't mean that we have to be best friends from ever, with everyone, but it's the way I show up in front of the otherness, in front of me, being this uh, another human otherness or nature otherness or radical uh, difference of what I feel, believe, and leave. You know? uh, and then from there, like new things have emerged but always with this curiosity of how could we uh, look at the other ways of things? No, what is the other side? What are we not seeing in the mainstream way of doing things? And uh, what could happen if we stay with the trouble of like, I haven't seen this and I just gonna stay with it to see what emerged from it. And I agree with, with Tony, there's not a, I think there's not a shared notion of what emergence means, but also there's not a shared notion of any of the concepts we explore and work with because it's an under construction things and it's uh, shifting all the time. That is what, for me, is very attractive of being part of this group of 
people, you know, like we are always um, like in the best case in from a, a position of friendship and kindship, explore together what else is behind, what started emerging and what else we could unpack this concept and idea through acting and, and putting in motion projects and ideas. Well, just to continue with the vagueness, <laughs> um, the question of how I became involved in the Emergence Network is still a mystery to me. Um, I think I'll pick up on the thread of, of friendship from Yeo um, because I think that uh, basically I said yes to being part of this um, because of my friendship and relationship with Bio Akumulafe. Um, we had met many years uh, before and we had tried a, another kind of translocal experiment that was at, equally as unclear and, and never flourished. Um, a lot of interest was uh, generated, but and didn't really ever go anywhere. And then uh, I, I supported, I took and then supported Bio with some of his online classes. Um, and from that, he invited me to come and, and kind of hold this space of the basket weaver of this, of this network, which is quite a, um, a wily adventure, I would say, to try to weave a container um, for this, this mystery a bit. Um, yeah, so I would, I would say that I came into the Emergence Network at kind of a later phase, actually, when there was already quite a bit of history and there had been years of dialogue. Um, and then this project that Yeo talked about, um, uh, Sanctuary, the Carnival. And uh, I, I think that there's this like strange attractor within 10. Um, and it sort of um, speaks to the Emergence or something that we can't quite put our finger on that that draws us in and and keeps us there um despite feeling disappointed by the lack of clarity sometimes and i constantly am trying to work with that as an invitation um to see the the effort and the the time and the and the energy and the love that we put into this uh without really having like a lot of uh of clarity or the kind of like measured outcomes that I think in our modern Western world, uh, at least for me, is is sometimes what what gives me a sense of satisfaction. So it's a it's an ongoing challenge for me to stay with the magnetism um, of that strange attractor, and I don't think I could do it without the friendships and the relationships of this group of people and those who are also involved that are not with us today. Yeah, I totally relate to that. I, I was hearing the three of you and remembering when I, when I met Bio for the first time back in 2014 in South Africa and, um, and he invited me to, to get involved in uh, the International Alliance of Localization, which then didn't work out and we, we started the Emergence Network the year after with another two friends and um, we, I remember we had a conversation with people from all over the world in the, those early stages about the, I think it was called similar to the book of bio, the, these wilds beyond our fences. And, and looking, looking back, back a bit, I think what called me mostly to, to this, what, why I wanted to create this with him was this sense of getting, wanting to get out of my habitual ways. You know, no, the, the, the Maybe this idea of trickster, of being a trickster even to myself, to just like kind of disrupt my habitual ways because I also didn't felt that uh, the ways I was thinking about change and the world were, were uh, it felt like something was missing. So, and then it took us two years more until 2018 to actually do something. And that, that was really interesting because every time we, 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 we had conversations about, you know, creating something, there was all sorts of problems we, we ran into. So we always got stuck in, you know, like how, how to navigate uh, all these tensions and nuances. And I, I think we got, got in a good place a couple of years ago of just also understanding that we need to, 
take risks and, and experiment. And I, fe I feel very alive with that and very blessed with having this space with you. And I was thinking, like, it seems we all, we all felt drawn to be in a place that is non-conventional, you know, um, that it, there's no, like, uh, that, that, there's no boundaries, or, 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 or although we try to kind of find some boundaries, so you're always struggling with this kind of porous, very uh, mobile boundaries of what is it that we work with, what are the concepts we we're exploring. So it feels really like a very experimental space. But we've been talking. I think another thing that is not that is kind of on the uh, uh, beneath the surface is this idea that the ways we've been working with change and thinking about change on, on, a, on the mainstream are not working. And I think it's clear, we've, I mean, if we look back the last four decades, a lot of energy of a lot of people were invested in change and we are in a worse place somehow today than, than that if we think about ecosystem collapse and other, other collapses that we're kind of starting to experience. So this idea of post-activism or, or a different kind of activism has been quite alive and this year, last year, we, the title of the work was Hope in Time of Hopelessness. This year is Meeting at the Crossroads. So I wonder, like, what, what is it that we are trying to explore and how that relates also with conflict? Because Viejo mentioned something about otherwise. Last year, we've done an online course uh, about... Um, meeting the otherwise in us, uh, around us, and what is the otherwise for, for us. And we had a huge exploration around that for a few months. So it, to me, this part of otherwising has been quite central in some of the conversations we've been having in terms of conflict, because there's the tendency to close. And we're talking about the gesture to open up to things we are not seeing, things we are not noticing voices we are shutting up. So perhaps we could talk a bit about that, how how we are relating our work with with this um, meeting trouble and meeting tensions and conflicts in ourselves, between each other, in the world around us. So I will say on that that the, the th I don't know if it's opening to the conflict, the, the, the way I see it, but at least stay with it, you no, know? like not jump into solutions. And uh, that is a very uncomfortable, but at the same time, generative place to be in the uncertainty, you know, and have a lot to do with this concept of emergence that I was talking before that allow things to evolve. And then instead of taking action to suppress the natural evolution of a conflict, for example, you know? and, and that for me, what were this part of the uh, the friendship attitude and to be open to kindness is crucial because staying in the non knowing, in the trouble, as you said, Nuno, you know, without being kind with yourself and kind with the others that are uh, accompanying you in that journey, could be very conflictive and and. Uh, and put you down personally and as a collective, you know? So that part of like staying with the trouble and be open to what wants to uh, evolve from it in a friendship kind, kindness attitude is, is something crucial for me and have changed the way I've uh, faced conflict in the last three years since, since I got involved in, in this sanctuary project. Um, something that I'm with at the moment around this is is around how the the ability. So if I speak personally for to, as a as a doorway into this piece, um, you know, I'm white, middle class, female. Uh, everything about my upbringing has, from external and internal and historical influences, has made me identify with being nice. Being nice, being kind, you know, that's 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 the way I should come across. Although, you know, to actually say being nice, then that's niceness also, kindness also have a very uncool, they're very uncool to the teenage part of me. 
but this um this attitude of niceness that then in entering into into sort of spiritual activism kind of circles and ecological change circles and personal development and spirituality and uh, nature connection circles it's like this this niceness gets amped up this need to always be kind and nice and um, transcend conflict. Because even as I say it, I can feel my rage bubbling. <laughs> because there's something, there's something of the hu- the life force, the kind of the, the generative, creative life force that exists in a human being when we see things that we really give a shit about. That when we're so busy being nice and transcending conflict that gets lost it gets squashed it gets uh it gets left out of um you know especially in circles that talk about being inclusive be inclusive but but not your grisliness not your rage not your grumpiness not your discomfort and there's something that that really excites me um having had to go through this journey myself around discovering the parts of me that want to punch someone's fucking face in. I have no intention of doing it unless I'm protecting my own life or that of my niece or something like that. But there's something where when, when, we, when we spend so much energy suppressing that natural response of um, that there's not so much of us left to, to allow for the otherwise to come in. So there's something that I'm interested there in how we stay with the trouble from a place of kindness and radical curiosity about the parts of us that just want to have a fight. And how do we do that with our art, with our hearts wide open and radical curiosity? You know, what happens if we can have spaces like that? And I'm very aware, again, as I say that, this is coming from a place of my privilege, very aware of what's been in the news today of... Um, over the last week of a number of particularly young black men in America who to have this conversation, it would be a very different thing, right? There's a very, very different relationship with violence there and with anger and with rage. So we may go into that in more detail, but I just want to name right up front that I'm aware that it's easy for me to say, to enter into kind of an artistic, creative emergent space around this because of my own safety and privilege. Thanks for naming that, Tony. I think that's uh, so important to remember um, that not all of us have the luxury to be able to explore these kinds of things with this level of spaciousness. Um, So taking that into account, I think um, one of the things that I hear in what all of you are are sharing around this um, is, is just kind of like, how do we take a step back um, from our habitual ways of thinking about things, particularly um, triggering things or, or conflicts that feel very important to us, you know, very precious to us, um, or we, where we might be attached to thinking that there is one right outcome. Um, and so if we can kind of take a step back from that, and this is something I'm constantly challenging myself to do, and I still feel very novice at it, to imagine all of the things we can't see, all of the things we don't know, which for me is the otherwise, you know, it's like, we just can't see this situation, this conflict, um, this relationship from the eye of the universe, you know, or something that big that we could see all of the, the elements, the subtle elements, um, you know, the ancestral stuff, the unseen, um, and and I think that even in the sense of the kind of more traditional conflict transformation or mediation, that for me feels like a very important step, um, is that step back to be able to see the situation with uh, much more perspective. And maybe at the Emergence Network, I would say we're, we're trying to cultivate um, even a little more spaciousness so that the otherwise could come in or even a, a non-human perspective might be able to be present in, in a situation that feels very human, you know, and so often it feels like as, as human beings, we're, we're kind of really in here. Um, and we've been, especially in the world that we live in today, kind of inculcated with these ideas of right and wrong and good and bad and, and very attached to our side of, of something. 
Um, and maybe I'll just mention here, because this is um, starting to come up in a, in a huge online event that we're um, launching this weekend called the Wilds Beyond Climate Justice. Uh, and I think as we've been trying to look at what justice is, very much attached to this idea of right and wrong, you know, that there's a final state of equilibrium and justice that we will arrive at. And I feel like at the Emergence Network and particularly with this, um, th this event, we're really trying to challenge that idea, you know, that whole concept that there is this um, arriving at a place of justice. Um, and one of the questions we're asking is like, you know, what if there, were, what if there is no right, wrong, good, bad? So that feels like an important part of our exploration, especially in this very moment right now. Yeah, I, I would like us to, to explore that a bit further and, and maybe talk of, touch on some of the, some of the open questions we are, we are grappling with, some of the issues that are maybe more exciting for us to explore. And I'm sure that all the four of us will have different, different takes on that. But for me, that thing you just mentioned of justice is quite relevant for this summit, Erin, because it's very easy to, to look at the cases like the situation in the States now with you know, the ongoing uh, violence of, of, authority, of, of police authorities towards black, um, black men. And, and it's, what is justice if... if, if uh, a, a, a black young guy gets killed by the police, and then it goes to a to a court, and try the people try to to come to judge the policeman, or that is that the kind of, is that a justice that that really serves us? So there's this idea of of a, a, a final resolution. One of the things we've been talking about in the summit is this notions like restorative justice or ideas that justice is something. Uh, not static or fixed, that justice actually is contextual. It uh, it's, uh, happens in the relationships that are established on the community level and it's, it needs to be held by the community. It's not something to be just taken care of by the, the involved persons or, or by the, the, uh, an external authority. Um, so, but there's other, other issues that, that I'm staying with um, regarding this, definitely there's been a, a, a kind of a pattern within the conversations of the of the of the summit uh, that conflict opens up a lot of uh, it's a space of potential, and that actually also conflict is a, is is an invitation for us to lean on something to take con conscience of something that is taking place within the system we are part of. And I find that what you mentioned, Tony, about the, the rage and different emotions we have is a great example of how we can look at that from our own inner, like, like organism, like our, our own individual system as a human being, that there's so much that we learn since we are little kids to suppress, to put aside, and that actually they, what, what I've come to realize, and I'm also curious to see your experience in that, but is things that I've put there you know, in mo in, 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 they start to show up in my life more and more, like to really just like in my face until I just take notice and start to work on them. One of those that you know I've been mentioning a lot is being a parent and and kind of defining myself as diff wanting to be different from my father and ending up now that I'm a father realizing I have so much more of him than I ever thought. So it's like, again, a slap on my face to think, oh, I, I'm such a great guy. I've managed to 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 be better than my father and just to realize that all the things that we kind of, um, all these patterns of family exist in us and it's part of our challenge as we, as we go through this journey of life. I, I want to stop a little bit in this part that you mentioned of restorative justice, because I think that that is also part of the other ways, no? Like we see, we seek justice as the punishment, but there's very little more in general in, in the mainstream world about what, uh, how to restore what was broken. You know? So one of the things we learn in the exploration of the sanctuary notion, the traditional one and the new one that we want to explore, is that uh, getting into sanctuary have 
very few to do with forgiveness uh, or or uh, mm. or very little to do with redemption you no know? when you are when you claim sanctuary you're surrendering to the acceptance of like i perturb the order even even if it's social or natural order that is created there and so i'm not going to claim sanctuary to ask for forgiveness or that or to like wash my hands from me actually it's a way of restoring what was broken inside me that made me broken that order that is bigger than my person right and there is a lot of um so that that implies probably a lot of regrets at the personal level right so and claiming sanctuary is how could it stay in those regrets and in those troubles instead of trying to put them away or fix them you no know? because and that's why for me kindness is very essential in here because if i hold myself if i hold my regrets or or the things i i know now that i made wrong with resentment or with guilt you will be very happy to transcend them it will be very hard to transcend them you no know? if i am kind with myself and with others that have broken the the equilibrium the balance or the order however you want to know it from a position of kindness then there is possibility of restoration you no know? but that implies that we not only need to recognize how much sin is in the crime but actually to how do we embrace and accept the sin Um, as you were speaking, Gail, um, just near the end, I was starting to to think about a lot of the um, hot spots that seem to be coming up in activist circles, where there's a lot of conflict coming up, particularly around things like social justice and uh, race and gender, and um, and it seems to be a, that we're in a time where there's a lot of reactivity and. Um, one of the I, I, I'm finding it fascinating and, and very touching to see how much that's happening and this sense of a lot of a lot of collective wounds that are that are rising up and and coming in too big too fast for these individual bodies to to quite handle without being without trauma awareness without the real capacity to to be aware of what happens in the body when collective ancestral cultural trauma starts to come into a space and and can get completely focused into one interaction between a couple of people. And so when you talk of sanctuary and this last piece that you said, um, that without kindness we can't, it's very hard for us to, to accept the sin. And I think that there's a lot, so if we come back to the, just to use it as, a, as a, an illustration as well as one of the most important themes um, around around race that there's a lot of people who find it really hard to be in a space where that's brought up as a subject and where finally it's being spoken about more and finally some of the passion of the people who've suffered is coming through and that one of the things I see and experience and I've watched it in myself over the years and hopefully tended to it by now this this white fragility or this this reactivity that can happen because we can't quite accept the sin mm. and so i think a lot of the work that's needed now includes sanctuary for those of us who have benefited from the oppression of others to have enough of a space of sanctuary to be able to kind of go mea, mea culpa and and for the the acceptance of the sin of collusion to, 
it's like it's a really important piece and I think I'm, one of the reasons I'm saying that is because sometimes I'll speak passionately about um, racism and decolonization and and the response I get is oh but why do we have to make ourselves feel guilty or you shouldn't feel so guilty and it's like I don't feel guilty I didn't create the problem but I do acknowledge that I took a long time to start trying to make amends and do something about it and it's still a sort of a long way to go but there's something there about how uh, um, the work of I really appreciate the work of Resma Menekin mm. um, who is working a lot with um, embodied trauma and and his unpacking what it's like to look at white body trauma, black body trauma, historical trauma, um, and and other pieces. And there's something in there that he's he speaks to the fragility that can be um, in white bodies because we have not had to deal with, we've not had to become um, resilient to and uh, build up. What's the word? When you when you run a lot and you build up stamina, that's it. We haven't had to had to build up stamina to be to sit in the face of trouble. Mm. And so while we haven't uh, had to face the same levels of trauma, and of course there's lots of intersectionality as a as a woman, I could speak to things in my own history of uh, trauma, but the levels of uh, impact and oppression and trauma that are there have also come with the capacity to build up stamina. So there's something about how do we create sanctuary where, where we don't then put white bodies in the center of the conversation, which I'm doing at the moment, mm. but we do it just enough to step back, to be able to step back. If I can follow up, one of the things that I was, was coming up for me is this sense that well, how much, how much dissociated from the a fundamental aspect of life, which is death, we are. So we are kind of seeing, we are coming to the terms with the end of most probably this kind of this civilization we grow up in, this uh, model of society of living in the planet. And I think a phenomenon of, of, of uh, announced death is that we, we kind of re revise what's, what has been the journey and, and all the, the, all the regrets and different things we've been talking about come to surface. So you're kind of having to deal with all these things coming to surface that are collectively there in our unconscious, uh, unprocessed, and now we need to process them. And it's so many things that obviously we already grow up in a in a in a kind of environment that our our uh, nervous systems are really. Um, stretched and and somehow also shaped in and rigid in many ways to 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 face these these challenging issues and coming to terms with them and composting because we, i mean we, we even call compost activism but i like more the compost activism like how we can nurture um spaces conversations ways of relating with each other that allow these things to be digested and not having to be forced to a, a way of thinking that um, is stuck on, you know, compensation for past deeds or this kind of thing, but, but, but much more in the sense of what this then brings me as a commitment and a responsibility to act and show up in a way that allows others to uh, allow me to connect to connect with others and not continuing to other them and in, in things in myself and and then allow new possibilities to emerge that's what was coming for me yeah that was exactly what i was thinking about nuno um and i feel like when we when we look at conflict and and difficult situations um it's so important to recognize the the importance of letting in our grief you know so i feel like that is one of the biggest challenges that we face is that we've also been um all accultured in a society that is both death phobic and grief phobic and we haven't really been given the tools um to allow that composting like you know and the 
and the feelings, all the feelings that can be, you know, of sadness, but also celebration and anger and of that breaking down, right? And I think that um, in in conflict situations, a lot of times, all kinds of things are breaking down. M- many times, it's the relationships, you know. And I feel like there's um, sometimes a resistance to grieve what's being lost, and it's it's both acceptance and also an honoring of um, of the endings of things, you know. And I really one of the things I really notice um, in in almost all the areas of my life is like how hard it is for us as human beings in this era to say this is over like endings feel so hard for us you know and um and i just think i was talking to uh someone who works a lot with activists and um she was bringing in the sense of of this question of grief um the other day and he was like well i am not going to grieve because that would mean i am hopeless so this sense of attaching grief with hopelessness like there's no there's no way out which is possibly very true there may be no way out um but how we associate um the experience of grief with giving up hope and for me it's actually almost exactly the opposite when we let ourselves go down into those feelings um and we traverse that sort of that abyss of, of grief, we are, we are transformed into other beings. And so that gives us, then we are, we are present in a conflict in a different way. Um, so I love that is that image of um, the compost activism, which is for me, just like letting things break down, being willing, being brave and being willing to say, this is over, you know? Um, and so much what I see is like people trying to draw things out and like, we can just make it a little bit better or we can, you know, and, and I feel like it would behoove us to practice conscious closure and, and honoring when things have reached their, their end. Um, and then at the same time, I, the other thing I want to bring in is complexity, because I think that we're living in times that are so complex. And often, as Tony was um, mentioning, like the layers of trauma, the generational um, pieces, as well as just all the different factors and actors in any one given situation makes it so hard for us to see the whole. And so I think that it's really important that we honor and and find ways to navigate complexity um, in in almost any conflict situation, but particularly looking at communities. I think it's really important to recognize that um, there are a lot of elements that we may or may not see. um, and just kind of being with that complexity feels like the first step, you know, in acknowledging it and honoring it. And we're touching something really deep here. I, I love this concept of composting because uh, the process of composting requires very little action, you know? So it also thinking of compost activism make me think like, what if the best action is the no action? and just be there, stay, and embrace uncertainty. Composting also is a a way of de-structuring the complexity, but not to make things simple, but to create another level of complexity, another way of of interacting that bring other kind of complexity, you know? And I was thinking as I was hearing the three of you about the, like the stake that the indigenous communities in Latin America have been posting in, in at the post-colonial era, no? And they have passed from resisting and trying to restore what was before to now actually say, you know, what we need you is to step on the side. We need to see what wants to emerge of the ruin and the ashes that you leave behind because there's something still alive that identifies us, that is our own way, and we don't need your help to raise it up or to make it look as your model, but for you to step on the side so to see what could flourish and how could we cultivate from there, from the seed that would decompose it of our way of living and of our cultures, to create something that is different of it, what it was, but it's also different of what you're offering because it's ours, you know? So, and that requires a lot of patience and stillness, no? It's 
And it's not that we have to sit in front of a compost to see everything degraded, but just give it the time for it to do and create the conditions of how could we use that compost then in, an, in a fruitful way for allowing flourish what wants to emerge. So we have we have a few minutes before we close the, the conversation. Uh, we talked about a lot, a lot of things. And I, I actually don't feel uh, called to make a particular question, but actually to just invite us to take notice of what is there that we might not have touched that we feel is really relevant so that we could still make a final round and just bring in some of those things that have been named or pointed out that are significant for us when we think about conflict and particularly in face of the very unique moment in human history we are living. We are all passing through the same thing, this, this experience of being all, all a bit overwhelmed because we've been like put down all these things that have been part of the individual and collective living conscience for, for a long time. Now they are surfacing, and we are dealing with all these challenges of a, of a, a system, a, a way of life that is coming to its end, and we need to do some um, hospice work, like you, you, you've mentioned, but also we need to birth new things, so we are in the midst of all this. And to, when we are inside of it, it's so difficult to to know what to do and how to be. And I think that's part of a big question for many people, like how, how to navigate these turbul turbulent times and, and, you know, and, and allow the flow and the, 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 the this turning to take place in a, in a way that is as healthy and regenerative as we, as we can. I think that's, that's, we can, we can say with a fair amount of certainty that, majority of people in the world would would love to that this would go smoothly and and might it might not but so what what can we do what is there that we are not we have not been touching yet um the thing that first came to my mind is it's related to a lot of the things that we have spoken on this uh, call but maybe not and maybe not has been said explicitly um which has to do with our feelings so i think um like really making space for how how we feel and that includes the more than kind um you know frustrated anger but also um the tender um the vulnerable I think that so often we, without even realizing it because it's so habitual, we defer to the mind. Um, and a lot of times it feels like our, our conflicts, especially when we're in that very much like debate kind of mode and, and that kind of dialogue as well, where we're um, defending our position, it comes so much from here. And I, th and I just think that practicing being in the heart, which is like, a huge challenge for me personally, I'll just say like my whole life I've lived in my head and just feels like in the last few years, I've learned how to um, drop down into my feelings and, and like say, it's okay that you can be here in this conflict and um, like welcome them and give them space, but also like tell the other people, you know, like we showed up today and I was just like, just feeling so much sadness for the world this morning you know that's what i woke up with and and when we speak from that place and we 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 drop down into that feeling place um i think that often it can create the conditions for for others to feel empathy you know and so um i just think that's kind of like one of the most important things we can do and and lastly um i've got this quote on my wall that says beyond defensiveness to vulnerability, to true open-heartedness. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about vulnerability the last few weeks and months and how we denigrate it. You know, we often put vulnerability into a list of like uncomfortable feelings. And I really want to um, advocate for, for shifting that. Um, I feel like, yeah, some of our greatest challenges come 
from feeling that we have to put on a, a performance, that we have to be um, one thing or another to the world to, to be worth something. And so we put on our masks and we create a lot of rigidity and structure and this is the way it has to be. And I think what I'd like to invite is just like the fluidity of the emotions that like melts that structure and that performative sort of obsession that we have. So yeah, that's what, what comes to me as we close out this conversation today. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Yayo. Uh, yes, yes to what she said. And, and so to build on that, uh, body, 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 body. It's like the, the, the amount of wisdom and uh, resource that there is if we can, when conflict arise, arises, even if it's just the tiniest whiff, it's usually the first place it usually arises actually is in the body somewhere, in our nervous system somewhere. And so the more that we can stay awake to and curious about body sensation, it's like, oh, oh yeah, something's going a bit cold or a bit hot or tense or heat, whatever it might be. And that therefore if I'm in conflict with somebody, that that my first port of call is to check how is my what's going on in my body, what's my body telling me? What's my mind maybe doing in response to that? But even just allowing the mind to be like another kind of body sensation, the activity of the mind. What do I need to feel safe enough to be able to stay with this trouble from a place of body? And so that, as Erin was saying about, our t you know, can I let the fact that actually I feel quite shaky, you know, I feel quite tender, I feel like I could be on the edge of grief, whatever it might be, can I allow those sensations in my body and to let it slow down enough. So the, the body slowing it down, like we feel the heat of conflict, but we so often speed up in it or try and squash it. And actually the, what's it like if we can slow down enough to relate with the other person, relate with ourselves, body feelings, needs, and then relate with the other person. And, and this sense of, you know, so often in conflict, it's so quick to go, well, I, well, I'm clearly the one that's right, or I'm clearly the one that's most vulnerable here, or I'm clearly the one that's most um, troubled and needs, whatever it might be. And, and to kind of get interested in what's this other person needing, what's going on in their body, what's, what, you know, what troubles are they carrying that means that they're right now they're, they're kind of itching for a fight. And again, it's like, how can we be interested in the other, take care of ourselves just enough to be interested in the other, to kind of check this, this, this theme of vulnerability is so important. And then there are kind of subcultures or cultures within the personal, de personal development world in particular, where we centralize our own vulnerability so much that we include the other. And so it's this kind of, how do I, how do I, how do we include vulnerability as a, as a key piece without it be kind of becoming or weaponizing it almost. And um, yeah, how can, I, how can I be there in a state of vulnerability, welcoming my own vulnerability and be interest, still be interested in the other and, and, and not have a clue what's gonna happen. Um, and maybe, oh, I could, it's, it's great. I love this subject. Thank you, Nina. And um, maybe the last thing I'll add is like, can I, can I handle being vulnerable? Can I handle the fact that the other person might have more vulnerability than me? Can I handle it being awkward? Can I handle being wrong? Can I handle the fact that this, if it's a friendship or, or working relationship, can I handle the fact that this might fall apart? And thank you, Erin, for speaking about, you know, our, our fear of endings. No, no, I'll fear of death. It's like, could I handle the fact that this might just end in a mess and I'll walk away and feel like shit? Can I include that as a possibility? Because if I can, if I know I can handle that, then I'm not completely obsessed with avoiding it. And there's space for something else to happen. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
So yes and yes to all that they have said. And I will just add that maybe that compassion and ability and, and like train that ability of see the other should also transcend the anthropocentric way of that we have been living and reading the world. No, so how could I make space to see what what vulnerability I'm creating in the otherness that is not human around me? Because I, I I have this suspiciousness that uh, that true restoration cannot happen unless we start taking account what is the mess that we have created beyond the interaction of human beings, and we have ignored the impact we have with all the rest of the things and beings that surround us that are not human, you know? So um, I, what I will say is that maybe mourning and, and dueling and, and griefing the death of this crazy notion that we are the center of the universe and of creation as human beings is needed. So we could make a space for something different to raise. And it might imply that we discover that we are not at the center of it, and then we start living our life uh, not not trying to solve things from my own perspective of this was the best or only perspective of creation and life. Thank you, Nuno, for this. I, I think it was a very fruitful conversation. And thank you, Erin and Tony, for, for sharing with us. I just want to throw one more final question in here, um, which is something that recently occurred to me. You guys have all heard it, but um, it came up uh, while working with some partners of 10 in, in February. And it was like, what if our only purpose as human beings is to be good compost for this earth? You know, like, what if that was it? You know, how would we live then? And I just feel like it's helped me detach from some of my um, kind of being so sure about things and feeling so important about our purpose and our uh, communities and our conflicts and our projects and and just to just to think of us as good pre-compost for this earth <laughs> and you wanted also to add something yeah i'd love to add one piece that um uh, when a conflict turns up or even when it hasn't turned up yet To, to be able to include the part of us that just bloody wants to have a fight. Sometimes I just want a fight. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's my niece, because I've had conversations like this over the years, my niece will sometimes say, can we have an argument? And we have a really, you know, we talk bullshit. It doesn't, it's not about anything, but we get to let that part of the life force that just wants a fight because there's so much to be angry about and frustrated about. And so the more we can let that fight happen in playful and relational and heartful ways, the less likely it's mm. going to come and bite us in the ass later. So the yeah. invitation I will post there is how could we fight in kindness? How could we fight and not avoid a conflict and the clash mm. from, from a different perspective that we usually come to? Mm. Yeah. It's interesting you bring that because I think one of the offerings that are going to be made on, on the fourth week of the summit is rage clubs. So there's going to be sessions around rage. Perhaps we can experiment with that. I Thank you so much. It was was an amazing. Uh, and, and it made me also feel like we, we should do this more often, definitely. I've been, one of the things that I want to point out is this, and it's somehow related with the, Composting, which was one of the main topics we, we explored a bit, is this sense that the myth of the hero's journey that you're going to, you know, go down the underworld and then save the world or come back to the normality with the, some gifts, it seems is not going to be meaningful for this journey. And I'm, I, I think I talked with you, Erin, a, a couple of weeks ago about feminine myths where that are much more related with falling apart and dissolution. And it feels much more that's like some of the things we've been talking about. It's like how we can allow ourselves also to dissolve, to reconfigure ourselves and each other as we go through this big change. And that led me, when I was hearing Tony speak about body, just to sense like how can we develop the ability to be in tune and observing our body 
observing the social body, like how we are interacting with each other, the movement of the bodies, how we sense that as a whole, and then the larger body of the earth, because we are all in there and we are a part of the of the web of life. And so it's really important to hold those kind of three lines of inquiry or exploration really present. And, and it's kind of challenging because school doesn't work, doesn't uh, work help us to deal with that. So that's another of the systems we definitely need to shift very fast. Thank you so much. It was a lovely, lovely conversation. It made me also feel how much I miss you. I've been missing you. So deep gratitude for being here.